You're listening to the Peaks Peaks Podcast. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Quinn. I am the assistant multimedia editor, and welcome to the Peak Speaks podcast. With me today, I have C, if you want to introduce yourself. Hello! Um, My name's C, my pronouns are he, him, they, them, and I'm the humor editor at the Peak. Woo! I forgot to mention my pronouns. My pronouns are they, them. So today we're going to be talking about pride a little bit, especially um, Canadian queer history, because I feel like... um, Pride in other places, especially the U.S., gets platformed a lot, but we sort of, here in Canada, kind of lose that ability to discuss our own sort of, like, events, like our own sort of versions of Stonewall and what happened here and how queer rights were fought for here. Um, But I think before we get into that, I just want to ask you, sort of, what's your relationship to Pride? Obviously, we're both queer individuals, but, like what does it mean to you to be like have pride in your identity and sort of exist in your in these spaces Ooh, um that's a really interesting way to phrase it because i think when i think about the word pride i think like specifically about like pride parades Mm. um and i think the first time i ever went to pride was maybe 2016 2017 so i think i was in high school Mm -hmm. um and that was back in ottawa that's where i'm from um and i had a ton of fun and in the years after that i marched in pride a few times um recently Mm -hmm. i haven't been marching i've just been like watching i've been having a lot of fun doing that Mm -hmm. um i always bring a sign i last year okay last year was iconic (laughs) obviously barbie movie came out last year so Mm -hmm. i had a double-sided sign and on one side it says barbie is a dyke and the only other side it says this barbie is Mm non-binary and i was wearing all pink and so many people Mm -hmm. took pictures of me i did not take a picture of myself but i remember the day (laughs) memories are more important than (laughs) photographs but yeah i just think that it's so fun and i love Mm. glitter but i think my favorite parts of pride seasons are usually like dyke marches and trans Mm -hmm. marches because i feel like they're more connected to what like pride used to be and i feel like way more like in community Mm -hmm. when i participate in that so i i love pride season as a whole Mm -hmm. um and i go to the parade every year Mm -hmm. but yeah i think the parade is less for us than it used to be (laughs) yeah yeah no rainbow washing capitalism (laughs) (laughs) um yeah no i think i relate to a lot of that my relationship to pride i don't know it's kind of hard to explain it i feel like A lot of things were stuff that I grew up with, Mm. luckily. Um, Even though it wasn't necessarily something that was super preached in my family, it was never something that was, like, negated against. And almost all of my friends from middle school onwards were a part of the queer community, and I just kind of, like, discovered my identity through interactions Mm. with them and through, like just existing in a space where discussing these things was so normalized and it was sort of like I don't know I feel like a lot of privilege and gratitude for existing so safely amongst my friends like even though homophobia was still a thing it was sort of like in the spaces that I got to grow up in because my identity was so accepted and Mm. my um sexuality was so accepted that it almost felt like homophobia was this like weird bad apple joke kind of thing that Mm. happened um like not saying that it isn't like a serious thing yeah um, but it just it was so off in the perimeters that i didn't like i knew it existed but i didn't really know it existed um and then i think growing up and you know seeing engaging more with activism engaging more with like protests and seeing more protests like come to light and also trump and all of that (laughs) sort of stuff that came to light with that in 2016 i was Mm -hmm. like oh this stuff is real and i've actually been shielded a lot um which is like a long tangent to say that i feel like i've been very comfortable in my identity as 
a bisexual person, as a non-binary person. Um, I think non-binary, coming out as non-binary for me was sort of, yeah, it was something, it was like a thing I kind of realized that I feel like, Mm -hmm. I feel like that was more of a challenge for me because um, I feel like I was always pressuring, even though I felt always accepted in my bisexuality and I never really felt that, like I always like, I never really like engaged um, heavily with transphobia because my spaces again were so queer friendly, but I was just like, oh, I can't be trans. I can't be non-binary because I care so much about presenting feminine. Mm. (laughs) I care so much about being this like perfect woman and I feel like I don't fit in. Oh. (laughs) Foreshadowing. (laughs) And so, yeah, that's sort of, and then pride sort of kind of enveloped into that yeah. for me was sort of realizing like, oh, this feeling of not fitting in or belonging isn't something that's wrong with me. It's with the marker that I'm choosing to identify myself with. It's sort of this like belief in how this sort of like deeply ingrained belief in how I feel like a woman should act and should be and this mm-hmm. like thing I need to live up to that isn't really me and then then along came gender abolitionist stuff and I was like oh gender is a construct oh I don't believe in any of this um, but yeah in terms of pride I think pride to me means like just getting to exist without scrutiny and just not feeling like you have to put yourself into something and just getting to be this amorphous blob of a person without needing to, even though so much of the queer community is focused on labels, but I feel like the end goal is to remove all of those and shed all of those and just exist. Um, So the first topic I'm going to talk about is censorship um specifically relating to like queer media but Mm -hmm. also in terms of like discussing like canada has a a long and rich history of um yeah i'm gonna say rich not in the positive way (laughs) (laughs) okay Um, canada has a long and rich history of uh, criminalizing um forms of expression and um queer people yeah. and that was actually very interesting to read about because we hear a lot about how Canada was one of like the first of four countries in like 2005 like one of the first four countries in like 2005 to um legalize gay marriage and then you have the whole Pierre Elliott Trudeau saying that um the state shouldn't I'm not going to quote this exactly. I'm going to paraphrase this, but like the state shouldn't have, doesn't have a place in the bedrooms of the nation. And so there's a lot of, I feel like fluff and, and fluffing up like Canada is this very accepting queer country. um, And better than the United States as a lot of people like to say. That's the only thing that Canada has is their identity is that we're allegedly better than the States. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And it's very frustrating, especially now knowing what I know, Mm -hmm. which is the long history before that and during that of criminalizing queer folk. Um, So I think I want to start off with um, the, what these laws kind of fall around um, and their sort of definitions and like what they're labeled as. And so we, the current law that we have today that still exists and still actually does um, from what I've found um, still uh, over penalizes queer bookstores and queer books and literature is um, the law regarding criminal obscenity. Um, so it is definition uh, uh, from the criminal code help website or the criminal code of Canada. You have um, so obscenity is defined in Canada um, around involving creating, distributing, or possessing obscene material like photos, videos, or audio recordings. This includes anything unreasonably that unreasonably exploits sex, crime, horror, cruelty, and violence. Um, and due to the Supreme Court's R versus Butler case, 
um, which essentially was a case regarding um, or challenging uh, the laws around pornography, which was f which fell underneath this um, line. That court case basically established two uh, tests for obscenity. Now, because okay. basically with that court case, the court case, the main, the determiner for obscenity in regards to sex mm -hmm. was anything that like the wider community could deem as immoral or um, not, or like any other Canadian shouldn't be like regarding or viewing. So it's yeah. like if the wider general community could deem it as gross, gross. Yeah. And immoral, then um, it could fall under being labeled uh, obscenity. Um, when was the case that you're talking about? Um, so the R versus Butler case was in 1992. Okay. Um, so after the case, um, it defined that pornography couldn't be simply defined, defined as obscene simply due to public notions of morality. Okay. Um, and as Jonathan Herlin notes in Sounding the Death Knell for Butler, um, which is a article written on this topic, um, the new legal approach would subject material to a test that considered whether the material in question involved the undue exploitation of sex coupled with crime, cruelty, horror, or violence. Um, and in order to qualify as obscene, um, yeah, needed to be labeled with degradation, violence, or dehumanization. This, however, had some issues with uh, queer materials because that was supposed to kind of relieve things a little bit and define things more clearly in a way that made sense. However, um, custom agents were uh, still, um, customs agents in the RCMP were still highly focusing on queer material after this case and were still penalizing um, queer writers as well as um, queer bookstores mm -hmm. after this case because this case didn't take into account um, media that was calling attention to or discussing sexual abuse and violence. Oh, okay. So we have an example of um, a lesbian feminist magazine called Bad Attitude being unjustly penalized and seized at the border repeatedly um, for because it showed more graphic content in relation to sex and violence, but it was a feminist magazine made to discuss these issues. And it was yeah. for women, by women. And this law was primarily changed initially to protect, to protect women, but it wasn't thinking, but it didn't contain context. Like it didn't, um, it didn't address the context of okay. um, queer art. Yeah. It wouldn't, they didn't, when the ruling was going through, they didn't listen to queer artists or queer writers um, to understand that sort of context. So actually, after this ruling went through, you had a lot more censorship of queer media because customs officials are essentially allowed to deem whatever, to, were allowed to cite this case and yeah. be like, anything in this, anything that kind of falls as obscene and dehumanizing we can just cite this case and be like, and seize it. Um, and that um, repeatedly queer material was being seized in relation to that. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> no, it does. And um, I think that's kind of interesting because you're like mentioning the case as it like, s like made the definition like more like clear. Mm -hmm. But to me, it still sounds like it was kind of, like st pretty open and yeah. it's like who gets to decide like what counts as like obscene mm -hmm. yeah and like they so basically they classified it mm -hmm. um so that like basically the way they kind of denote what gets charged with an obscenity charge and what's okay is so number one the first one that will always get a charge um or always get um seized is explicit sex with violence the second one is explicit sex that is degrading or dehumanizing. So that one's based on context or okay. it's supposed to be based on context. And then the third one, which will 
generally not be seized unless it's like child pornography is explicit sex that is neither violent or degrading. But the issue is, is that the first one, explicit sex with violence, yeah, it disregards media that is critiquing that or um, is made by people who were affected by sexualized violence or Mm -hmm. affected by like the male gaze um, and discussing that in like a more graphic way. It's um, it unjustly punishes those instead of going after people who are genuinely trying to hurt people with sex, sexual violence. Yeah. Yeah. But yes, I think it's still vague and I think it's still, I I don't, and it hasn't been amended since 1992, despite like several bookstores challenging it. So wait, what kind of media does this, like this applies to any media? This applies to any media. Okay. Yeah. Like across the board. Um, I just feel like a lot of pornography falls into that I category. I know. That was also the thing that I was thinking of. It's like, I was like looking at this as like, like, I feel like they're not doing a great job of yeah, I'm coming not. through this anyways. <laughs> <laughs> like, like they've taught. So like, um, there's a lot of notes of like, basically yeah. th- the amount of books that were seized. Like apparently... In 1990, estimates of about, like, 75% of books bound for gay and lesbian stores. So this was before the law was um, altered, but 75% of books bound for gay and lesbian stores in 1990 were detained or seized at the border, which is a lot. Um, But the issue is, is that, so that was happening, and that's still, like, there's still seizures and stuff happening today that these bookstores note. Mm Mm-hmm. But the issue is, is that, like, that's happening, but it, I, I think the main issue with this case is being, it's being unjustly overly applied to yep. queer media. And clearly, as we've both existed in this world, we can tell that it's not being justly applied to other media that is actually violently degrading and dehumanizing with the purpose of sexualizing that instead of discussing yeah. it using sex. Um yeah anyways i don't know if that was like that makes sense to me yeah um did you have like another legislation that you wanted to talk about or like yeah well like i think the butler case for me brought up like um it kind of like that's sort of what got me into the rabbit hole of like being like okay but what came before this okay and like what were the laws before this because yeah, this one is a very complicated one, and I would suggest anyone watching this to um, look into it yourself in case I've missed anything or, like, misworded anything. I don't think I have, but it's a very complex topic, as you guys can see from me scrolling through my notes <laughs> rapidly, that, like, it's very hard to summarize. Um, so please look it up yourself and and action go into it further. Um But yeah, so basically, I, from this, I was sort of like, well, what else is happening? Um, And like, what else happened before this? So the biggest question I had was, okay, did anything else happen after this? Found out, not really, no. Um, There's been some sort of legislation moved forward about like, uh, the internet, and maybe like, applying sort of like, similar laws to the internet but i don't think it's necessarily gone through yet and it doesn't seem that seems more of like a broader like discussion of like access like sexually violent material on the internet and less to do with this case yeah and then um before this all the way back in like 1850s um, and this is where, yeah, I started to kind of generally look at laws criminalizing queer folk. And this kind of moves away a little bit from censorship specifically. But I feel like by forcing people to stay in the closet, you're censoring them as well. Um, and so we start off with, um, and this law is tied to the British crown and being a colonial country. Um, so I'm pretty sure this law comes from the British as well. So way back in, like, I believe 1850, we had the 
the law called the Indomitable Act of Buggery, which referred to somedi- sodomy, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, which was punishable by death at the time. So if you, and it, and I would say one thing about these laws is that it clearly, they clearly targeted gay men specifically because a lot of them had to do with being found out doing anal sex and sodomy and um, specifically focusing on men and um, finding them out. Um, and then it changed to um, gross indecency in 1861, which remo- they got rid of the death penalty, <sighs> changed it to 10 years imprisonment. <laughs> Solid. And then we jump, so big gap in time, we jump to 1948 and 1961, mm-hmm. um, where we actually went backwards a little bit. <laughs> which further criminalized homosexuality through the invented categories of criminal sexual psychopath and dangerous sexual offender, um, which could lead to even worse charges than 10 years imprisonment. Um, So, yeah, you could be, so your prison term could be extended indefinitely if you were found to be a dangerous sexual offender by prison psychiatrists. Pretty much, it seems, up until... Like, generally, I feel like 1960s are a bit of a vague year when this was kind of being phased out. Okay. But up until 1969, which is when gay sex was decriminalized, Yeah. before that, for um, being queer and for engaging in, you know, immoral sexual acts, immoral sexual acts in scare quotes, um, you could be labeled um a criminal sexual psychopath or a dangerous sexual offender i also say psychopath in regards to what the law said not in terms of like yeah using that term as like oh no okay way to refer to people at all um so essentially it was very interesting um to kind of read that that like yeah pierre trudeau is the one who um pushed forward or helped push forward the um, passing of the bill C-150 in 69 that decriminalized gay sex, but right before that, it was heavily criminalized. Mm -hmm. Um, I also have more tea on Trudeau, but I can get into that in the next topic. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Do you have any questions? Okay, so this is what you talked Okay, so you mentioned this up until 1969 mm-hmm. to stop a decriminalization, uh, but then there's also still censorship of mm-hmm. like queer media up until today, basically. Yes. Um, were you reading anything about like the purge? I feel like it's like interesting because it's like in the between mm-hmm. the time periods that you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like between like the 1950s to like uh, the early 1990s. Um, uh, you couldn't work for, like, um, the Canadian public service yes. um, if you were queer. Um, it was, so any type of, like, 2S LGBTQI mm-hmm. plus identity was seen as, like, a character witness, like, weakness. And so, um, basically, you like, the idea would be that you'd be more, like, vulnerable to, like, mm-hmm. blackmail and stuff like that. So you couldn't, like, <laughs> you're getting excited. Wait, I absolutely know <laughs> what you're talking about. Yes. Awesome. Um, and so I think that it's kind of wild, like, how long that lasted. Mm-hmm. And, like, it's still kind of, like, recent Canadian. Like, there are people who are alive today who were mm-hmm. fired because of this. Yeah. Well, yeah. Also, kind of, I'm so glad you brought that up <laughs> because in terms of what I was talking about, Trudeau is that, um, like, Trudeau, who, again, is, I feel like, specifically Pierre Trudeau. Okay. Um, who I feel like is given a lot of accolades for the way he handled queer issues. Mm -hmm. Um, funnily enough, in terms of regarding to the purge in 1973, so this was after decriminalizing, um, queer, uh, queer sex, um, Pierre Trudeau confirmed that suspected homosexuality was one of the factors that the government considered before clearing any federal employee to handle classified documents. Yep. So, funny, funny guy. Um, great that you, 
Like, I feel like that sort of label, I feel like reading through this, that sort of label of who were, like, champions of things Mm -hmm. um, was very interesting to kind of learn that they necessarily, they not, weren't necessarily that. Like, I'm not here to say that, like, he didn't say those things, but he also clearly was concerned about who was queer handling federal documents yeah. Like, that mattered. <laughs> yeah. And it was only in 2017 um, that uh, Justin Trudeau, actually, <laughs> um, ended up apologizing for, like, The Purge, mm. um, which I think is really fascinating in terms of, like, Canada's, like, global reputation as, like, yeah. a leader in, like, queer rights. Um, Mm -hmm. when, like, we have this very recent history that a lot of Canadians aren't aware of, actually. Um, A lot of Canadians are not aware of this history. This is not taught in schools. Mm -hmm. And then we have the apology coming in so late. Um, Or even, I think it was Toronto Police, I think, apologized for the bathhouse raids in, like, 2016. Mm. Um, So we're still dealing with our own stuff here in this country, and we're still like acting like we're better than everyone else well yeah yeah exactly no i thought okay going into like a bit of the rcmp yeah um yeah i think that like the purge like and the purge especially um that is such just like wild information to find out about like yeah in regards to the cold war and deeming them safe to handle um documents or not um or just like be like they weren't there wasn't like the people who were getting fired weren't just people who handled classified documents it was mm-hmm. also just regular federal employees yep it was like you could you could have any mild connection <laughs> and you would get fired which i'm like great way to focus all resources on this um yeah cool um instead of like anything else um And I think what was really interesting to me learning about that was, like, A, how they were lumped in with, um, like, the so they they lumped in queer people alongside people who gambled, committed adultery, drank heavily as, like, people who might be vulnerable to blackmail. Mm -hmm. But then, like, yeah, the purge primarily focused on queer individuals. Yeah. So I go okay feels like this is just an, an this is just an excuse to do this other thing um and oh, well, yeah it was also that like in terms of also the RCMP the ways in which they tried to identify who were queer and who weren't like so they committed a lot of surveillance yeah. I'm pretty sure that the so my thing here from um, the Canadian Encyclopedia says about there were about nine thousand files on federal public servants um, by nineteen sixty eight, um, and there was instances of people dying from interrogation about their sexuality, especially John Watkins is a key example, but there are lots of other ones as well. Um, But it's also like their other key identifiers (laughs) were ranged from people driving white cars to wearing rings on their pinky finger to wearing tight pants. Cool. So, um, still today, I think people are trying to figure out if the gaydar is real. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) It's not. And the Canadian government is bad at it. They're very Um, bad at it. But yeah, it was just, as you said, like a lot of resources put into surveilling people, interrogating Mm -hmm. people. Um, There was a lot of like abuse happening. Mm -hmm. People being encouraged to like kind of like rat on their coworkers. Yeah. very dark time mm-hmm. very dark time in queer history yeah very dark time and like i just want to like kind of going in terms of like the rcmp's failed attempts or like failed attempts I, as i have written in my notes here rcmp trying to scientifically identify the gay um <laughs> i have 
Like, so one example was, like, in 1963, they tried to map out where LGBTQ uh, plus communities were gathered in okay. Ontario. Um, and they were going to put these places under surveillance. Yeah. But the map proved to be useless because it was covered in so many dots. Yeah. So that didn't work. And then they decided to, they came up with this wonderful thing that they called the fruit machine. Oh, yes. Yes. Explain it, please, for our, <laughs> for our listeners. Which was by showing um, individuals assumed to be queer, uh, sexually explicit material of the same sex, and to see whether their eyes dilate or their pupils dilated. Um, indicating, therefore obviously indicating sexual arousal. Downside about that was that they could not recruit enough individuals <laughs> to test it out because there was a reluctance, and this is again coming from the Canadian Encyclopedia, there was a reluctance among normal males, mm. in scare quotes, within the force to volunteer because they feared being misidentified. Yeah. Um, as they were right, test results were incredibly inconclusive and eventually it was abandoned because it, there's no way to scientifically like identify a homosexuality with a test, especially like that. Like, yeah, it's just such a ridiculous concept. Um, somebody really thought they did something. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, did you have anything else that you wanted to add on to this or did you want me to like transition into homo nationalism? I feel like you can transition into homo nationalism. I feel like I have a lot of little gaps in yeah. like the stuff that I talked about. Okay. But honestly, I don't know if I'll be able to fill them. <laughs> All right. Well, as I'm talking, if you want to, if it yeah. reminds you of something or if it connects to something, say For sure. words. I will. I will. I love words. I love words, too. Okay, so um, we were talking about how um, just the bad things mm -hmm. that the Canadian government has done uh, to, to us LGBTQI mm -hmm. plus communities um, and how that connects to kind of like Canada's identity as a nation. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of like the topic that I wanted to bring up is the concept of homo nationalism. Mm -hmm. um, do you know what homo nationalism is? I feel like I can guess. Okay. Um, do you want me to guess? You can if you want to. You don't have to. <laughs> I think I'm assuming, I mean, hearing nationalism in the name, um, mm -hmm. I'm assuming it's something along the lines to do with nationalistic ideologies, but... I wanted to hear from you first. Okay. So homo nationalism is actually a combination of the concept of homo normativity and mm. um, nationalism. Mm. So homo normativity, uh, I think, was coined by Lisa Dugan. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of thinking about these kind of respectable, like, white middle class um, gays, usually gay men, but this can apply to lesbians as well. Mm -hmm. And... So, yeah, it's if you're thinking about like the queer community, and mm -hmm. this is going to make sense if you're part of the community, but yeah. if you're not, maybe you haven't noticed this. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's kind of been a divide in like queer organizing, mm -hmm. like in regards to like respectability, yeah, and like um, who gets like accepted and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. And so, there's kind of this idea that like people who are I guess like white middle class want to be part of the nation like mm. kind of like aspire to like these kind of lib neoliberal ideals of like individualism and stuff like that um mm -hmm. pro-gay marriage um essentially these people who are exactly like straight people but they're gay <laughs> I know. that's <Yes. laughs> that is like the the quant like the mm -hmm. ideal like gay person and the kind of like um we're trying to lead the like queer movement in that direction mm -hmm. to kind of be more accepted because i yeah. think when it comes to the general population being like having maybe like a single mom sex worker mm -hmm. um person be like the face of the movement is like less palatable than having yeah you know what so i mean it's, it's like that like notion of like uh 
is it like kind of similar to like exceptionalism exceptionalism yeah 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 exactly um so then when you combine that with nationalism Mm -hmm. you're kind of thinking through and this is so homo nationalism the term has been coined by jasper poir she wrote this book called um terrorist assemblages Mm -hmm. um which is really good you should check it out (laughs) this is a recommendation for everyone (laughs) um (laughs) And um, so she's thinking about it not in the Cana- not in the Canadian context, but in the American context mm-hmm. um, on, during the time of the War on Terror. So we're yeah. thinking like after nine eleven, and how the state, so in this case the American state, mm-hmm. is now accepting queer people, but like in order to position itself in a certain yeah. way, like it's like against, re- it's like consuming yeah. them into like capitalism and colonialism maybe yes but also kind of like encouraging them or like using them as a way to justify the war on terror Mm. so it's like the idea of like oh this country in the middle east doesn't respect women and Mm -hmm. so we need to go bomb them for feminism and then it kind of flips um, after 9-11 to we still do this when it comes to women's rights yeah a country still definitely use that rhetoric but then they started using it as well with like queer people yeah so the idea that like homophobia is really rampant in the middle east for example so this justifies um the war yeah. on terror uh kind of the idea of like you're bringing in civilization you're bringing in progress mm-hmm. um Ooh. Which is funny. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, did yeah. you have something you wanted to say? Oh, no, or you were just no, having no. like the this is funny thought. No, no, that like when you when you started my dots connected and I was like I know Okay. What you're talking about. Yeah. Um but yeah, and there's a lot of research uh that has all like a lot of researchers have also connected this mm-hmm. to like the Canadian context because arguably yeah. the Canadian government also does this. Mm-hmm. Um that's actually what my master's project was about. So yeah. <laughs> there's, oh, cool. there's a paper on the internet mm-hmm. about Canadian homo nationalisms mm-hmm. and I wrote it. Um <laughs> oh my gosh. But um <laughs> <laughs> Wait, now I just want to talk to you about this. Now you want to talk to me about this? I love talking about people's theses. Yeah. Um, But yeah, so the Canadian government also does this kind of positions itself Mm -hmm. as a safe haven for like queer people. Mm -hmm. And, um, but we're still kind of only accepting like a specific kind of queer person, right? This is kind of, this is where the homonormativity comes Mm -hmm. in. It's not like the state is like, oh, now we are protecting all of the queer people. It's like this very specific subset of people we are now using to justify participating in these kind of war operations, Um, which is really unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think that's, and okay. So going back to the purge, yes. Um, when so it was public service RCMP military that you yeah. couldn't work in, um, and now like the military like actively tries to recruit like queer people. Mm-hmm. Like they make like pride like videos all the time, yeah. and like they're like, oh, like this is like a great place for like queer people, mm-hmm. even though they're, they're it's not there. Are, it's not. <laughs> it is still not. Um, just changing one law does not mean that the people within the institution are now suddenly respecting each other. Yes. Um, <laughs> exactly. It's not. But then it's also, like, again, recent history. Like, there are people, there are veterans who are victims of the purge. Mm-hmm. You can't go back and just be like, oh, yes, now the Canadian military and the RCMP yeah. are inclusive without wanting to even like acknowledge or be like real about that history. Yeah. Um, that doesn't really work. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's also kind of like, how does this connect with queer politics more broadly? Yeah. And I think this is also part of the divide between like kind of like gay and queer within the community when it comes to activism mm-hmm. is that, um, like settler colonialism is not compatible with queer liberation. Yes. Right? So you can't just be a gay person in 
like yeah, <laughs> in the RCMP or be a like a gay like police officer yeah. um or like be part of the military and then be like oh yes I am doing queer liberation mm-hmm. by being included here and having a rainbow flag here well yeah actually if I, yeah two things two <laughs> things number one I wanted to say that like yeah in regards to the purge as well is like one thing I saw as well is that how it was like people who had moral character weaknesses but it was also people who were deemed like taboo in society who had this sort of like their right and it was like i i read it um when i was looking at that i was like i I was kind of reading it as like people whose identities are inherently political Mm -hmm. being seen as more closer to communism more closer to uh socialism which obviously was you know in the red scare in the cold war as well and i was like in my head i was like that is very interesting because we hear a lot of discussions of people, yeah, trying to separate their identity or trying to separate themselves from being political. And you can see that happen even in queer spaces, um, like Queers for Trump mm. <laughs> and stuff, like where people what are... What are those? <laughs> yeah, it's like where people are trying to separate their identities or their personal living life experience from being political when it inherently is and I feel like the purge like reading that about the purge I was like oh well even if you don't consider yourself political the state does yeah the state's going to see you as that and if we and it's sort of that it really came up for me is like if you if people are consistently positioning themselves closer and closer to power it's like if you are a marginalized, if you have a marginalized identity to any degree, it's a, the state is eventually going to come for you as well. And mm-hmm. instead of being in solidarity with people who are oppressed and acknowledging intersectionality and acknowledging the inherent political nature of existence, instead of acknowledging all of that, like and standing united with everybody, you are iso- you are isolating yourself from others, trying to position yourself closer to power white queer neoliberalism Mm -hmm. um trying to position yourself closer to more palatable power without understanding that you will also be targeted eventually like like this kind of um positioning and white supremacy and politics like they don't this kind of stuff doesn't um it, like it's not going to keep anybody safe at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. It's like a, uh, it's a snake eating its own tail, as some people might say. Um, and mm-hmm. then I also sorry, no, you're <laughs> sorry good. for totally interjecting. Um, <laughs> I also wanted to say that also brought up for me as well in regards to censorship as well was how the people leading that sort of charge for the R versus Butler case um, in terms of yeah, in terms of like redefining it, they were they wanted to redefine it in terms of women's rights, in terms of protecting Mm -hmm. women from a violent pornographic industry, Mm -hmm. which is valid and understandable. However, they didn't, this law ended up being unequally applied to other feminist spaces that were more intersectional. So it, yeah, it ended up being applied to the Bad Attitude magazine, which was a lesbian feminist publication that was explicitly having conversations around the male gaze and violence within Mm -hmm. sex and using sex as an art form to portray that with consenting adults who were happy to be a part of it um and that magazine got unjustly punished in relation to that law that was championed by feminists specifically as they noticed specifically feminists who were focused on pornography as always being considered violent towards women because they were viewing it in a very Mm. sort of like I don't want to say like Puritan culture but viewing pornographic or sexually explicit material as consistently bad and like women who participate in that or feminists feminists who participate in that either are deluded or are um, you know unable to think about their situation or they are contributing to this violence against women Mm -hmm. instead of actively using the kind of material to critique it. Um, Sorry. So, yeah, I think that sort of, yeah, like 
um, this sort of trying to avoid intersectionality or trying to be seen as like the most palatable gay person to Mm -hmm. a colonial state always somehow for me at least I see always somehow devolves back into like these very Puritan like yeah heteronormative values that we're just trying to fit ourselves back into these boxes to be Mm -hmm. considered palatable instead of um, trying to forge a new path or trying to forge anything that's outside of colonialism, anything that's outside of Europe <laughs> as, or like, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that's actually <laughs> really interesting uh, that you phrase it that way, because obviously like when you were going back to the history, you started, I think mm-hmm. 1850. Mm-hmm. So this is like very connected to yeah. like the history of Canada as a settler mm-hmm. colonial settler colonial state yeah um and all of these laws are by the settler colonial government so you yeah. have um essentially these colonizers coming in and mm-hmm. um not only policing other people who are part of the colonies but obviously policing yeah. uh native people and mm-hmm. creating their own narratives about gender and sexuality yeah. related to indigenous communities um and trying to be like oh this is why we are more like civilized Mm -hmm. or whatever than them and this is why we need to um either like create legislation about this or like teach them which was basically just genocide as we know um Mm -hmm. so yeah that's really i i don't think that you can talk about things like yeah um like pride Mm -hmm. without talking about like colonialism yeah actually you like it's it's completely <laughs> it's completely connected mm-hmm. and um now that we're like however long into the palace like the genocide in palestine yeah. um we're seeing similar things happen yes um, you might have heard um kind of a, a similar rhetoric of like oh well if you went to palestine as a queer person you would be like shot immediately um how am I going to go to Palestine? Yeah. Uh, for And also that is not true. And homophobia and homophobic hate crimes happen globally. They happen in the West yeah. as well. Especially like... Um, <laughs> You you tell you go oh that you'd be shot if you went there it's like oh, you people can. are getting shot here absolutely is it not June twelfth today is it not the um what is it uh do you call this anniversary of the Pulse nightclub shooting oh. like yeah w- this happens um so that doesn't make sense and even if you could prove that homophobia was more Mm -hmm. prevalent in Palestine. Um, That doesn't mean that you're supposed to commit a genocide. Like, you're not supposed to bomb people because they're homophobic. Since when has military... Like, there might be some cases, but, like, every example I've seen, since when has military intervention ever worked to um, help marginalized communities? within a region like military intervention from a global superpower (laughs) like queer palestinians are also dying right now they exist and they are also being victimized right now so this is not an argument that makes sense but it's actually very common and it's kind of related to and you've mentioned this term a few times so rainbow washing Mm -hmm. um which is also called pink washing i think the term pink washing came first um um, which I think is so interesting because we're talking, I think, early 2010s, I think, when we started using the word pinkwashing. Mm-hmm. And it was specifically in relations to Israel's, like, um, mm. public relations oh, policies. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, and it was people noticing that um, Israel was starting to position itself as, a, like, a safe haven for gay people and as an ideal, mm-hmm. like, location for, like, gay tourism. Yeah. Um, and also using rhetoric that made it sound like Palestinians were, um, I guess, like, less inclusive. I don't know. Um, yeah. And so, like... Uh, that Israel was like more progressive Mm -hmm. and that they were kind of using this to justify the occupation. Yeah. 
Um, so other countries also engage in this. We, ch- we gave examples already. Um, so um, pinkwashing isn't exclusive to Israel, but Israel does still engage in yes. this. And so it is very much like, again, all these things are connected. Yeah. Um, and this is actually how I ended up learning about Palestine. Mm. Um, I think I was in the first year of my undergrad, Mm. uh, I was studying uh, political science and gender studies at the time. And so I think I was in this queer theory class and we were talking about, oh, what is the name of this organization? Let me see. Uh, Quaya, um, it stands for Queers Against Israeli Apartheid. Mm -hmm. Um, And this was in, what year? I think 2010. So this is like a Toronto-based yeah. uh, grassroots group. Mm-hmm. Uh, exactly what the <laughs> what their name is called. They are queers against apartheid. Yeah. And um, in 2010, they were banned from marching in um, Toronto Pride uh, because Toronto Pride essentially um, kind of banned the term Israeli apartheid. Um, Wow. They ended wow. up being able to march. I think there I think there was backlash or something like mm-hmm. that. And so they kind of reversed the decision. They were able to march, um, but it kind of went back and forth for years. Yeah. I think the city kind of got involved on like whether there was a lot of conversation about like whether or not you could actually call it apartheid. Mm-hmm. That was essentially what it was. And yeah. so the discussion, the idea was that if you say this about Israel, you're being like disrespect you're being anti-semitic mm-hmm. and you're being disrespectful to um south africa and that was kind of the idea here um and these are conversations that we were having what like 15 years ago yeah and so at the time like i'm learning about this i'm like whoa i never even knew that this was happening mm-hmm. um and i still i don't feel like i understood even like how serious like the occupation yeah. like was and is like I think that the past like eight months I've learned like so much me too um because I was just like because a lot of people talk about it in terms of like being a conflict right so you're like oh yeah the you know these two equal states are at war which is still bad yeah. um but you're not you're not thinking about it through no. the lens of occupation and so I was like what what is such what is the big deal that you're like these people cannot m- march at pride yeah um but a lot of people were really against it um and they were speaking out specifically against like the pink washing from mm-hmm. like uh the israeli government and just in general uh, but against the occupation mm-hmm. and they have been doing like even people who have been kind of educated about this issue in the past like couple months yeah um like this activism has been going on for so long And it has been really prevalent in the Mm -hmm. queer community. Um, And it continues to be because it is so important. Our struggles are all connected. Um, And I think it's going to continue to be important the entire, like, obviously, until Palestine is free. Yeah. Um, But I think it's still going to be a huge topic in terms of, like, pride season as a whole. Yeah. Um, And about, like, what is even pride, like, about and who should be allowed to march? Um. Because I think it's easy to think about Palestine as being an issue that is completely disconnected yeah. from 2S LGBTQI plus rights. Yes. And so you're like, oh, why are you doing this here? Um, similar conversations happened, I think, was it 2016 when Black Lives Matter stopped Toronto Pride? I, I It was it was one of those years. Don't, uh, don't quote me on this. Yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> it was around that time. Um... But yeah, similar conversations mm-hmm. of like, why are you doing this here? But the rights of like black people are connected to the rights of queer people. Yes. Um, and so I think that it was obviously it was the space for it. Obviously, yeah. like something that was intended to be a riot, something that's intended to be a protest. Yes. Talking about social issues there and not just throwing around glitter is is yeah. relevant. I, I mean, think. I mean, you know, and. <laughs> In terms of if we're going to talk about what's relevant at Pride, why is BMO there? Why is Scotiabank there? You know, why is HSBC there? Why is the why are the cops there? Like, why are the missile companies there? Did yeah, you see what? Lockheed Martin keeps going to Pride parades? And I'm like, why? So you can sell us rainbow missiles? I did not see that. What what is this about? I thought you were gonna just talk about like them like <laughs> posting on Instagram of like, their little no, pride flag. Like they've been go they've been attending pride parades for years. Oh. 
Ugh. This is this is what our pride parades have become. That, that's <laughs> so sad. That's so sad. Cause it's but like, you can't say Israeli apartheid, though. Nope. Nope. That's too political. What's that ev- episode of Avatar The Last Airbender? There's no know. There's no war in Bossing say. Oh. <laughs> it's like, you can't speak about it. No. Shut up. Actually, in line with that, in terms of, like, who's present at Pride, as well as also, like, um, regarding, like, um, why do, like, what's the space for Palestinian pride at our pride marches or in, like, Canada is that, like, yeah, I fully agree. We need, like, these, pride is a protest. Pride is supposed to be a riot. It's supposed to be uncomfortable for the status quo. If we become comfortable for the status quo, what are we doing anymore? Um, And I think in regards to that, it's, like, it's so frustrating hearing people go like oh what's the point of having palestinian um marches and solidarity here like that's so far away that's so not an issue here and it's like but it is though um because again we can't ignore the fact that we're also a colonial country that is still trying to commit a genocide to this day and is still and has a very very violent history and i think in terms of like yeah it's sort of the thing is like let's talk about like the reason why we have like two in lgbtq two s people um and that sort of acronym why do we have the two spirit um aspect in the acronym yeah. and it's because that comes from indigenous people here it's a title that um and forgive me if I'm wrong here, this is me following my notes, um, but it was a title that specifically was meant to reject sort of how gender and sexuality exists in boxes to white Eurocentric society. Mm-hmm. It, like It's supposed to be an encapsulation of culture in relation to gender and sexuality and not mm-hmm. just fitting into these ni- nice, neat little boxes and acknowledging that like, yeah, our culture influences who we are. Our culture is a part of who we are. Um, and I think it's also really important. And in regards and in acknowledging that term, I think it's also really important to acknowledge like how like conversion therapy was only fairly recently outlawed here. We're not better than the United States. <laughs> we only fairly recently outlawed that. And there are still many groups today kind of navigating and getting around that term to persecute people. Um, And then, and in line with that, like, I feel like we can talk about how that's also just a big aspect of colonization. But, like, I feel like it's such a big topic. Do you know, like, when, what Um, year it was made illegal? Basically, when it was made illegal. Mm -hmm. So... Um, according to this is this website is wisdom to action dot org and it's Ooh, timeline, I used to work for them. Oh cool cool. <laughs> um, timeline of conversion therapy in Canada. An incomplete history. Um, and the last thing on the timeline says that so twenty twenty one Bill C four passed, the House of Commons and the Senate of Canada unanimously passed Bill C four, um, an act to amend c- criminal code conversion therapy this new bill responded to previous community concerns and significantly strengthened the legislation to include protections for both minors and adult Mm -hmm. um so it creates this bill essentially creates the following new offenses causing another person to undergo conversion therapy um b doing anything for the purpose of removing a child from canada with the intention that that child will undergo conversion therapy outside of canada C, promoting or advertising conversion therapy, and D, receiving a financial or otherwise material benefit from the provision of conversion therapy. Yeah. Uh, And so I believe in 2021 was when that was solidified, which was very, very recent. Yeah, that's why I wanted to kind of, like, clarify, like, when we're saying, like, recent history, we mean, like, yesterday. Yeah. (laughs) This is not, like, something that was, like, a super long time ago. These are still, like, issues that we're fighting uh, like for today yes and we're seeing this kind of with like the rise of like kind of like 
right wing ideas and stuff yeah. like that. Even in Canada, like mm-hmm. people are pushing for more and more like anti trans, anti queer like yeah. legislation. Like this is like a cur- this is a today problem, and a lot of these laws and because we saw mm-hmm. this happen with like Roe v. Wade in the states, yeah. like this can be like repealed, like this can be like brought back, and a lot of people are kind of. Yeah. Like, just because we won something doesn't mean that it can't be taken away. Like, we still need to be showing up. Like, this is still an issue. I think recently, was it in Saskatchewan? I think if you're, like, a kid, like, in school, um, like, your parents have to approve, like, if you want to, like, use different pronouns. Yeah. So these these are, like, current issues. Well, yeah, and also, like... I, just to touch on the fact that, like, like Roe v. Wade, our stuff can be taken away. Um, yeah, our government has not codified either. I'm pretty sure. Fact check me on this. But I'm pretty sure our government has not codified our version of Roe v. Wade here in fir- terms of protecting abortions. Which means, mm-hmm. yes, it can be very easily repealed because it was decided on a court case like Roe v. Wade was. And it wasn't codified into um, the Constitution, I'm pretty sure. To round things out, essentially, I feel like this majority of this conversation um, revolved around just like came to the final resting place of like colonization is at the root of like almost all oppressed struggles. I would say, honestly, all of them. (laughs) Colonization and capitalism is the root of uh, oppression um, in our current world right now. And so overall, this was kind of really heavy discussion Mm -hmm. on um queer history in canada but then it kind of evolved a bit more globally um Mm -hmm. because uh borders are fake um and these are all really important things that we need to continue to think about obviously year round yeah uh, but are as we have explained really um deeply connected to what we should be like talking about during like pride season Mm -hmm. um which is like really heavy but i think we can also talk about things that kind of make us happy i think that that's also part of like um queer resistance and like resilience in our communities so um is there anything that you're excited for during pride season or any like queer media that you've been like really into recently I will happily discuss what I've been listening to. Ooh, yes. um, I know it's so popular right now, and like a part of me wanted to gatekeep because I knew her before she blew up. But Chapel <laughs> Roan, <laughs> Chapel Roan, you have my heart, and now I you're love you. Gatekeeping Chapel Roan. <laughs> I know I can't. I gatekeeping's bad. Gatekeeping's bad. Yeah. But I swear I liked her before Coachella, and you guys cannot get mad at me for that. Um, but yes, I've been listening to all of her songs, especially Feminine Nominon, Guilty Pleasure, um, and Pink Pony Club. I was singing them to myself very wildly yesterday. Um, alone in my house, very loud, because I can um yeah that's like my main music i'm listening Mm -hmm. to in terms of like other queer media i haven't been consuming a lot of shows or films recently because i've been studying a lot um so instead i'll just mention like some of my favorite films that are like queer um in terms of one of my favorite films of all time but i'm a cheerleader i forget Mm. who directed it (laughs) Um, but I'm a Cheerleader is one of my favorites, uh, has Natasha Lyonne, one of my biggest celebrity crushes, um, but also has a young RuPaul, which is wild to see. Yeah. Um, so I have been locked in <laughs> on RuPaul's Drag Race All-Stars Season 9. Um... I'm, I feel like I'm new to, like, the, the Drag Race fandom. I really started watching Drag Race, like, last year. Yeah. Like, but I've also just been falling in love with drag in mm-hmm. general. So mm-hmm. I've been going to a lot of, like, local drag shows. Um, I love drag kings so much. And I'm so sad there are no drag kings on RuPaul's Drag Race. I know. Um, 
someone make it happen, please. Um, but yes, I know a lot of people are kind of critical of this season because there, it's a not an elimination mm -hmm. and they're doing it for charity. So it feels like there's no stakes. Mm -hmm. But I'm just never going to complain about more drag on my TV. I love queer art. Yeah. Give me more queer art. And they're so beautiful. <laughs> the looks are amazing. And mm -hmm. it's just been such a fun time. Yeah. So I hope Got Mick wins. Um, I said it. If, you're, if you disagree with me, go argue with the wall. Okay. okay. She is a well-rounded queen, okay? Mm -hmm. It's just true. <laughs> is there anything else you want to add before we wrap up? Yeah. Very quickly, I just want to say that um, in terms of RuPaul's drag race, <laughs> drag race, I wanted to say that um, Katia and Trixie, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> You're beautiful, and I've been watching your YouTube channel a lot. Um, okay, and then... Yeah, um, this has been a really wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for coming in. Thanks um, for having me. I feel like I've learned so much. Just Me too. And I feel like I have so much to continue learning as well. Um, oh, yeah. It this, never stops. Yeah, this is, I was like, oh, yeah, if I limit myself to just these topics, it'll be fine. No, so no. much, so much history. And I feel like in regards to that as well for the audience listening, Please, please, please. Um, we're going to link our sources in, des in the description below. Um, so please, please, please take time to read them. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just want to say thank you guys so much for listening. Shout out to CGSF for letting us use their recording studio. Very nice. Yeah, thank you. Um, anything else you want to mention? Happy Pride. Happy Pride. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye. This has been the Peak Speaks podcast. Thanks for listening.